Okay. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Panania Anglican Church. Uh, also, a big hi to those who are watching us online. You're not forgotten. Now, today we're continuing our, se- or restarting our series from the book of John, the Gospel of John. And the working title for today's sermon is Drinking is Believing. Now, now you may see me drinking a little bit during the service. I've got to get a dry throat. Ah, it's better. And I want to assure you that inside this is a clear liquid. <coughs> and the chemical uh, combination is H2O. So, uh, please. I'm not quite sure what John's drinking later in the service. We'll have to stick around and find out. But meanwhile, as we worship here today around God's word and speaking to God, it's great to know that when we speak to him, he listens to us and he wants us to talk to him. And he also loves it when we sing our praises to him. And that's how we're going to start now. Please stand for our first song. i 
please stay standing for our children's song this morning. Thank you, Jackie. church with you. My name is John. A couple of quick things from me and then an announcement from Stephanie, our children's minister, with a bunch of helpers. My two things are our little course that we announced at Easter and very relevant because we're going back to John's gospel today, which is six afternoon sessions on a Sunday, just talking through important parts of John's account of Jesus' life. If you've never done that before, if you're new amongst us and you're trying to find out what is Jesus all about, then come and join me 
Uh, it's on Sunday afternoons. Uh, I think there's a little QR code for you there to quickly snap or otherwise speak to me afterwards, but it starts on the 28th. Uh, second announcement is that tonight is a special night. We won't be doing uh, the same passage tonight. Uh, in, if you want to come along and join us, we're actually going to have a combined church's celebration of school scripture. So we'll have people from six or seven other churches with us tonight, uh, and we'll be hearing from Hannah, who's our local area coordinator who we employ across the churches. So it's going to be a wonderful night celebrating SRE. Our federal member, David Coleman, will be here to talk up SRE. So I encourage you to enjoy this morning and come back at six o'clock for the second round. Lastly, uh, tomorrow the guys are going on holidays, but the rest of our staff team are here. If there's anything over the next couple of weeks that you need, uh, speak to one of them. Uh, if you call the church number, you'll get Brendan instead of me for the next two weeks. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. Uh, I'm going to get my special helpers from our Friday Kids Club group to come up as well. Or can you, yep, do you want to turn it around the other way, guys, so we can see? We're showing you uh, some of the things that we've done in Friday Kids Club this term, and I've got a few of our helpers here to share what they've enjoyed uh, about being part of Friday Kids Club. Uh, we meet every Friday afternoon uh, until after school until 5 p.m. This term, we have been learning from the Bible about Joseph with a theme of archaeologists and discovering cool things from the past. Joseph's story reminds us that God is in control and can use people's bad choices for his good plan. My favourite thing that we do at Ki Friday Kids Club is art, acting, stories and activities. Uh, and you can see here, hopefully, the banner that we've made uh, this term to remind us of the stories about Joseph. Thank you to all my helpers. That's great. You guys can take a seat now. Um, and I would just like to... Yeah, we'll give them a clap. <laughs> um, and I would just like to uh, remind you that uh, it's, we would love to have more people come and join us at Friday Kids Club. Uh, anyone in year three, to, uh, in kindergarten to year six can come uh, and join us. And we are hoping to have a few more adult leaders too. So if you're interested and available... Come and talk to me. Um, next couple of weeks during the holidays, we won't have our normal Kids Connection and Sunday Children's groups, but we will have um, activity packs like this for the children to uh, enjoy. So they're welcome to come to the service as well. And we'll have the room out the back uh, with the um, service from in here being uh, streamed out there so that you can be out there with your children if they would like to do that. Uh, or they're welcome in here as well, of course. Um, and now I think we're going to have Greg come up to give uh, an update for, um, yep, for the, the adults and the children are going to go out to their programs uh, while Greg shares with us about parish council things. Just wait for the chaos to finish. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I've been told I've got one minute, so I've got to speak quick. So listen. No, I'm not. I'm going to slow down. Um, because of Easter, um, the AGM was actually two weeks ago, which seems a long time ago. So there's a new um, uh, parish council, of course. So if you go, oh yeah, the slides there. So down the bottom of that slide on the left, so the, the people, if you don't know, Andrew Cooper, Paul Curtis, Sophie Luttrell, Ben Pringle, Wendy Waterworth, Mark Waterworth, uh, Braden Wilkes, Greg Young, and then the wardens, James Mann, Josh Padman and myself. Uh, and Wendy is the uh, uh, treasurer again. Um, so we actually met yesterday for the first time in a little mini retreat at Waddle Grove um, and did some fun things. Um, as well as did a meeting. Um, so, uh, going back up to the top of that slide, just a, an update on the finance. Um, uh, as of the end of March, uh, we're still 10 to 14% behind on budget. Um, round numbers, that's 10 grand a month, but we'll just leave it at that at the moment. Um, and a further update 
will uh, be given next month because that's remember the letter in uh, in January so we said we'd give you an update after the first quarter so that's technically next month um, but you get the idea so what we did yesterday um, did our usual proceedings and then with the new members um, they were shown what it all means like uh, all the finance reports um, it's a bit overwhelming the first time and then we looked at, from the AGM again, there were recommendations from people. So we started working through those um, and we've been, people have been assigned to look into whatever the topic is and get back to the person who raised it. So that will happen shortly. And then we're also in the background looking at um, upgrade projects for the building, the whole site. That sounds weird when I say we're behind on budget, but we're hopeful to try and get some grants again. So that's why we've still got to look at things and get quotes and then maybe hopefully we can we can score one so again underneath that in blue if ever you want to ask a question or comment or complain or whatever to parish council just send us a mail uh, hello at pananiaanglican.com.au of course you can tap us on the shoulder but if you'd rather just send a mail we'll get it um, and then also the Elvanto system that we've got, the software system, all the approved minutes from uh, Parish Council are stored there. So it's never a secret. If you want to see what we actually talk about, just um, either again tap us on the shoulder if you can't uh, have access to Elvanto, or, or look there and you can have a look for the last year if you really want to. Um, yeah, anyway, enough of that. But good news, uh, just on the mission uh, side of things, uh, we finally got a photo of Siddiqui who we've been supporting um, since 2022, I think, um, through uh, Anglican Aid. So we've, um, he's going through college at Bunda Bible College in Tanzania, so he finishes uh, next year. So we said we'd, um, we'd help him through that uh, three years. So anyway, that's what he looks like, because um, it's been hard getting information, just leave it at that. Um, so that's all, so I did, I did go over a minute, but not to worry. So, but please contact us if you want to know anything or ask anything. Thanks. Oh, sorry. And now we're going to have another song, but I can't remember what it is. Please stand as we sing Come Thou Font. Oh 
is my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Please be seated. It's time for our favourite segment. That's the one. Now, it's a special edition today. There are prizes. So you'll need to pay attention. Now, I've got Jackie here. She's going to help me because I don't want people calling out. I want hands raised. And Jackie will nominate you. And then you can give your answer. The first one is a hard one. But it's a special prize. Now, if you concentrate very hard, and you'll see some writing on the left. No, it's not judges. Sorry. Anyone else? Can anyone read that small writing? Jury. Okay, that's a, that's a big hint of it sounds like the start of a book. I, I heard it, but I didn't see a hand. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is correct. Now, I know it's a bit hard, but jury, Jeremiah, and he's holding... Hold, okay, I, I, I don't make these. <laughs> and he's holding up a, a really dirty, rotten sash, and that represents... Judah's rottenness. So the book of Jeremiah is an autobiography of one of Judah's greatest prophets who challenges his nation's greatest faults. Idolatry, perverted worship, moral decay. And he tells them that judgment is going to fall upon them. Now if you want to work out what happens, you'll have to read the book. Now, I said there were prizes. Now, because today is all about drinking is believing, the prize for the first one is a gift certificate of a free coffee from the coffee cart. <laughs> now, now if, if that isn't particularly suitable, um, then you can have a half-price tea the, in the kitchen. <laughs> okay. So now we'll move on to our second one, and again, I need hands up. John is correct. J on, and here's John. He's painting a picture of Jesus as the Son of God. And for that, we have a special gift from our other John, without the H, and that is a special book on John. Okay. So thanks to our winners. Okay. Um, now, just to get us familiar with John again, here's a special promo for us to watch.
Um, it's time for us now to uh, pray for a short while. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can worship you anywhere, in spirit and in truth. We ask that you fill us with the knowledge of your will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience and give joyful thanks to you. We thank you for all the blessings that we have received in this church over the last 12 months with growth of our church members and fellowship. We praise you for the 16 growth groups that meet regularly and for their leaders who faithfully work to grow our knowledge of you and love for one another. We thank you for our ministry team, John, Jackie, Brendan, Stephanie and Nigel, and ask that you encourage them in their ministry. Make them faithful in, in their preparation and wise in their relations with us and outsiders. We praise you for, your, for their commitment to the gospel and ask that you would prosper their ministry amongst us. We thank you for the playgroups as an opportunity for outreach. We ask that our non-church members feel welcome and are able to ask questions about our faith. Help our members to respond lovingly with the gospel. We pray for the Uncovered Jesus group commencing later this month. We pray that those reading John's gospel will learn that he is our saviour and put their trust in him. Help John as he facilitates that group. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will convince members of our congregation to undertake biblical or theological training and consider full-time ministry in Australia or overseas. We thank you for the bursaries we are able to give more college students and ask that you help the small committee as they select worthy recipients. May these small gifts to students help the gospel be preached in many places. We pray for the Living Water Church in Redfern as they minister to indigenous and non-indigenous persons in their local community. We pray that their gatherings on Saturday afternoons and at other times will be times of learning about you and growth in love and fellowship with one another. We pray for Malcolm and Leanne in Vietnam as they plan to leave in July. We ask that their remaining months might be fruitful. We thank you for their 10 years of service in Vietnam. Give them perseverance in a long semester. Help them in their planning to return and support them as they say goodbye and settle back into Australia. With Tim Wilson in Melbourne, we thank you that two students, uh, we thank you for the two students who came to his church on Good Friday, one from an unpe unreached people group and one from a Catholic background country. Give t Tim wisdom as he works out how best to help them. We continue to pray for Gaza and especially for the family of uh, Zomi Frankham the aid worker that was killed there this week. And we ask for comfort for their family during their time of grief. We ask, Lord, for sufficient aid to be available to avert famine there and improve the quality of life of the refugees. We also pray for the release of Israeli hostages. We also remember other conflict areas such as Ukraine, South Sudan and Myanmar. And we ask, Lord, that the leaders will act in the interests of the weak and powerless in their countries and work hard for peace. We continue to pray for those affected by cost of living pressures. We thank you that inflation um, has decreased and that the Reserve Bank appears to be preparing to drop interest rates. We pray for responsive governments with helpful initiatives to ease these pressures. We continue to pray for Anglicare and other organisations as they help those in need. We pray for those affected by the storms and flooding this week. We ask, we ask Lord, that you provide them with support they need and give them comfort in their troubles. We also pray for SES, fire and rescue, police and other support workers 
uh, and ask that you keep them safe during rescue and clean-up tasks. Finally, Lord, we pray for those areas of increased crime in Australia, such as Alice Springs and Moree. We acknowledge that these are complex problems with difficult solutions. We pray that the leaders at all levels will have courage to address the issues in a meaningful and sustainable way so that peace may return to these communities. Give courage to the Christians in these towns to assist healing of their communities with the only true solution, the gospel. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And let's continue in prayer as we bring our faults and failings to God and ask for his forgiveness. Please join me in the prayer on the screen. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us by your Holy Spirit. Enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his Son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen to that. And let's continue now with penitent and thankful and joyful hearts as we sing at the cross. Please stand.
Let's read from the Bible now. If you're following the Blue Bibles in the pews, it's on page two, uh, sorry, 747. And we're reading from the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 2, verses 9 to 13. And it's the beginning of the prophet Jeremiah, and it's from the chapter that says, Israel forsakes God. They weren't just prone to wander. They weren't just prone to leave the God that they loved. They had already done that. And this is what God says to them from Jeremiah chapter 2, starting at verse 9, finishing at verse 13. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Kittim and look, send to Kedar and observe closely, see if if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns broken systems that cannot hold water. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. 
Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am He. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, such a moving encounter between this woman and Jesus, Lord, and yet we too thirst in many ways, and we pray that your word might quench us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the sensation of thirst is something everyone can identify with, and the marketers know this well. A hard-earned thirst, complete the line, needs a big cold beer. Uh, or do you know this old, old one? Image is nothing, thirst is everything, obey your thirst, Sprite. Solo, of course, the thirst crusher, remember Solo? They all do it, that image, they, they sell you this image of being dry and hot and parched, you, you know, the, the breath rasping through a dry throat and then they show you their product. We all know the feeling, being thirsty is such a desperate state. Can you remember a time when you were desperately thirsty? I remember being on a school camp uh, back out in the Central West where it gets very hot and we're on this camp and we're out in the bush and we drunk all our water and we just had lunch and, and at the end of lunch was left over all these tins of Golden Circle Pineapple. And if you've ever opened these up, they're so, they're drenched in water, they're juicy, and this was the only water source left. And so they started opening up these tins and handing them out to the kids, and we all lined up. And I remember getting closer and closer to the front of the line, feeling my thirst, and I get to the front, and it's the last slice. I can hardly believe my luck. I'm going to get the last slice. And do you know what the teacher did to me? She pulled it out of the tin, and she went as if to eat it herself. And I think she saw a little bit of me die <laughs> in that moment and she stopped and she, she handed it over to me because it's no joking matter, is it? Being thirsty is a desperate state. And today in God's Word, we start with Jesus being thirsty, but the real thirst is on the other side of the conversation. There's a real spiritual thirst and Jesus offers this woman and us a tall glass of ice-cold water. And we're supposed to, to feel what's being offered here, viscerally. You know, if I hold this up and I start talking about having dry lips and a, and a parched throat, and then I do this in front of you. You know what that feels. That's the sensation in a spiritual sense that is going on in our passage. But we're resuming a series in, in John's Gospel that we started last year. We did chapters 1 to 3 then. We're doing chapters 4 to 7 for the next term. And we pick up the story as Jesus retreats from Jerusalem to Galilee, verse 1. And he's doing this because he's timing his run to the cross. He doesn't want to force the Pharisees' hand too early and, and force them into a confrontation. So he heads north. But to do that, to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, you have to go through a place called Samaria. Now, Samaria is part of ancient Israel, just like Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, but you might remember this, of course, because they're the 12 tribes that broke up the land of Israel. And so in the south was the Jews, the, the tribe of Judah, and in the north 
were a bunch of other tribes. Now, we left these brothers, the brothers of Israel, united at the end of last week in our Genesis series, but by this stage, they've split again. And actually, after they established the kingdom and King David and King Solomon, the northern ten tribes broke off and had their own kingdom. Uh, in fact, it was worse than that. They, they got uh, attacked by Assyria, resettled, other people brought in, and so they're a whole mishmash of people now and gods. They're intermixed, not just by blood, but by worshipping other gods. And so the Jewish people looked down on them. They, they despised them. These were the mudbloods of Israel. So travelling through Samaria for a Jewish person is distasteful. But at the same time, the land they're going through has rich significance. And Jesus stops at Sychar, which just happens to be near the land that Jacob gave to Joseph. If you've been here, remember we know this, Jacob and his son Joseph. Joseph was the favourite and he gave this special extra bit of land, it tells us in Genesis 48, to Joseph. I think we have this. And to you, Jacob, to Joseph, I give you one more ridge of land than to your brothers, favourite son, the ridge I took from the Amorites with my own sword and bow. In fact, Joseph is buried not far from this very spot, maybe within a kilometre. So you see how it pays to read the whole Bible. We've just done the, the history of this place. And that sits in the background. You fast forward 1,700 years, there's a well that Jacob dug, Jesus comes to that very well, a well that Joseph would have drunk from himself. That's all in the background. But also in the background is John's purpose for this book. If you were with us last year, remember John has a goal for writing this book, recording these details from Jesus' life. And here it is, John 20, 31, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life in His name. That's His goal, that you believe and receive. Believe and receive. Believe in Jesus, receive eternal life. And if you know that's what John is doing, then you start to see what's happening in this little section of John we're in. John is explaining what it means to believe. In the next few chapters, you're going to see a whole bunch of pictures of faith, metaphors for believing. And this is the, the first one in a sequence. We'll talk about drinking today. Drinking is like believing. But there's a whole sequence. Eating is like believing. Working is like believing. Hearing is like believing. All these little pictures of faith, but today it's drinking. Jesus offers a, a tall, iced glass of water, and that's a metaphor, that's a picture of what it means to believe. So Jesus encounters this Samaritan woman, He asks her for a drink, but He's really offering one. And she loves the idea, but we'll see she's actually avoiding God. She's actually avoiding God. And we'll look at how this conversation then gives us a picture of faith and that drinking is believing. Well, there's two things we really see in this passage if we break it up. The first part is verses 7 to 14. This woman is clearly spiritually thirsty. She's spiritually thirsty. Verse 7, Jesus sitting at the well, he's physically thirsty. The disciples are in town, he's had a long journey, any chance of a drink, he says, when she turns up. There's a little glimpse, Jesus is authentically human, isn't he? Gets tired, gets thirsty, he's a real guy. But she's the one who's really in need. Firstly, we know that, why? Because she's fetching water in the middle of the day says the sixth hour. That's an important detail. People don't fetch water at midday because the sun's overhead. It's the hottest part of the day. They do it in the morning. Why doesn't she do that? We're going to see she's an outcast from her town. She's had a, a string of broken marriages. She doesn't need the whispers and the giggles and the slurs. She's going to pick a time when no one else will be there. Sadly, she prefers the heat of the day. And secondly, she's a Samaritan. She says it to Jesus, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you're not supposed to talk to me. You know the history. She's an outcast member. 
of an outcast people. How can you ask me for a drink? So she's, she's in a desperate state, this woman. She's alienated from God and God's people and even her own people. And so here she is, this daily grind of having to fetch from the well in the heat of the day, living water bucket to water bucket, desperate for some kind of relief from this existence. But Jesus sees that thirst and he offers her a drink. Verse 10, if you knew, if you knew the gift of God and who it is speaking to you, you would ask and receive living water. Living water. You see, there's some kind of metaphor happening here, not water, water, living water. And she's confused at what he means. Verse 11, you don't even have a bucket. How can you get water? Are you going to dig a whole new well? Are you better than Jacob, our ancestor? But Jesus is not offering her filtered water or some kind of magic water. He's not talking about water at all. What is he talking about? What is the metaphor? Well, in John 3, if you remember way back to when we were doing John, Jesus spoke to a man named Nicodemus and told him about being born again. That was another metaphor, being born again, about starting a, a new relationship with God. And it's the same kind of thing here. Jesus is saying, just as getting water from a well gives you one kind of life, I'm offering you something to give you a better kind of life, a spiritual life. There is something to quench that life thirst, that desperate state of life, disconnected from God, to fill that hole. You know that, that famous saying of St. Augustine, in every human heart there's a God-shaped hole. Well, it's like a, an empty well, a dry well that just sits there waiting to be flooded. And Jesus says, yes, I asked you for a drink, but if you knew what I can do for you, you'd ask me. You're desperately thirsty, are you not? And I have a spiritual source. But what he's offering her is not just a bucket full. You know, the metaphor kind of breaks down. She's offering him a, a glass of water. He's offering her not just a glass. There's something more to what he's saying. He offers to quench her thirst permanently. Everyone who drinks this water, the well, will be thirsty again. Just get a bucket of water, take it away, you'll have to be back. But whoever drinks my water, he says, will never thirst it will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Somehow you'll be carrying a whole well around with you, not just a bucket. So as we read God's Word, we now ask at this point, so what is the water? If it's a metaphor, if it's a picture, what is this water? Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. He's already said to Nicodemus, you must be born of water and the Spirit. And we've just seen in this very chapter that Jesus isn't baptising people with water. Why not? Because that's just a picture of what He wants to do for them. He wants to baptise them with the Holy Spirit, as John the Baptist said He would. John 7, he says it straight out. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. This is what Jesus is offering her. The water is the personal presence of God, offering God himself in the person of his Spirit, coming to dwell in her heart and when she has that, she won't need to somehow keep recharging, refilling, going somewhere to get life. She'll have life. I think this is one of the great errors of Christian thinking. It's kind of the bucket-filling thinking. 
that, the, that life is about going somewhere to get a bucket full of something I need spiritually. I go to church to get a bucket full of encouragement or a bucket full of knowledge or a bucket full of experience or a bucket full of emotion and then it kind of runs down through the week and I have to come back for another bucket. That's not what Jesus is offering. And that's really important, isn't it? If you think your salvation somehow gets filled up and then depletes, or, or your connection with God somehow gets filled up and then, then just degrades, you haven't understood what Jesus offers. In fact, what you'll find is that your, your spiritual life will just be this ongoing cycle of dry spells. Do you know I spent a, a decade dehydrated? whole decade I spent dehydrated. I went to uni and started work and, and I just felt like I needed to just drink coffee and coffee and coffee. So I drank so much coffee, like up to eight, ten cups a day. And you know, I thought that's, that's empowering me to do the work I need to do. But what it actually did was desperately dehydrated me. I didn't realise the symptoms. It never occurred to me, why am I getting so many headaches? Why are my lips always desperately cracked and dry? Why is it I'm always feeling drained in the late afternoon? Never really connected the symptoms. And then I ran into some random guy in a coffee shop and he said to me, do you, do you think drinking six shots of coffee at a cafe and no water is doing damage to you? I never, never connected the things. And I, I started drinking water and it, it changed my life. I started drinking water and I felt so much better. Well, Jesus, Jesus is not offering us a bucket. He's offering us the well. He's offering us not just replacing one thing with another. He's, he's saying, I can change the whole situation, the whole desperate state. I can give you a, a permanent, personal connection with God now. And he says it will well up in eternity. That connection with God will never end. That will be the start of an eternal life with God. So the water is God's own spirit. But what does it mean to drink? Because Jesus is talking about drinking. Verse 13, verse 14, whoever drinks the water. What is the drinking? Drinking is believing. Drinking is asking Jesus, coming to Jesus, believing that Jesus has the water and trusting that he will give it to you. And you'll see this as we go through John. Whoever believes in me, he says, John 6, will never be thirsty. John 7, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. It's actually all over the, the New Testament in the, the last couple of chapters of the Bible. Jesus says, to the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. So do you see those two things there? The living water is God the Spirit but drinking the water is trusting in God the Son. That's how you receive the water, believe and receive. So are you thirsty? Are you spiritually dehydrated? Have you been in that state for a long time? Do you identify with this woman of Samaria, cut off from everyone, including God? Where will that kind of thirst be quenched? I think our instinct is, oh, I just need to dig some deeper wells in here. I need better resources somehow. I need to, to help myself into a better state. The Bible says, watch out for that. Watch out for that. What you don't just need is to dig deeper. You need a whole other source. And that's what our Jeremiah reading was about. God's people kept going to the wrong source to quench that thirst. Jeremiah 2, my people have committed two sins, they've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Don't fall for that lie that you just need to dig deeper, that will quench the thirst. That's like drinking salt water, you know, to quench your thirst. It looks like it will do the job and going down, maybe it even feels a bit the same. But what does salt water do? Makes you more thirsty. In fact, it kills you in the end if you keep drinking it. That's not the way. Ask for the living water. 
come to God the Son and receive God the Spirit. But also, a, a Christian person, someone who has done that, they've come to Christ, received His Spirit, may still experience those spells of dryness in their spiritual life. Does that mean they never came to Jesus? Does that mean something's gone wrong in their faith? No, there's, there's an emotional curve, isn't there, of life. We will go through those dry spells. That's not a lack of God's Spirit. But it is an encouragement. It is an encouragement in God's mercy to go back to the tap that is always on. Go back and stick your head under the tap that God has provided. Dive back in the Scriptures flood your life with prayer, drink again of that trust in Jesus. Back to the cross as we sang, at the cross, that's where all the good things flow. So our passage starts with Jesus asking for a drink, but He's really offering one. And our Samaritan woman is spiritually thirsty, but then we also see that kind of perversely she's avoiding drinking. She's spiritually thirsty but she's also avoiding drinking. And this is verses 15 to 26. She's avoiding drinking. My kids are pretty sick of me saying, no matter what happens to them, I say, just drink some water, you'll be better. And so I've got a headache, drink some water. Got a nosebleed, drink some water. I'm hungry, drink some water. And they they can't understand why that's my solution to everything. The reason it's my solution is they're not drinking any water. They haven't connected the symptoms with the problem. And yes, there's other possible explanations, but but in their case, they're perversely avoiding drinking water. They're coming home with a full drink bottle. They're running out to play and not drinking a drop on a hot day. And so, of course, there's something odd, isn't there, about about avoiding the very source of life-giving water. And that's what the Samaritan woman is doing. She loves the idea of what Jesus suggests, verse 15, great, give me this magic water so I don't have to keep coming back to this well. But she hasn't understood the the metaphor yet. Not because she's stupid, she's quite spiritually reflective as we go on. But she hasn't quite grasped, we're not talking about water, we're talking about relationship with God. And she's avoiding relationship with God. You can see that because firstly, she avoids talking about sin. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, go call your husband. Oh, I'm not married. Jesus says that, of course, because he doesn't want to just save her. He wants to save the whole town. And we'll see that next week. But he's also just starting to press on an area of her life where she's been avoiding God for a long time, where things are obviously gone wrong. And she needs help. When she says she's not married, she's deflecting. Jesus said, oh, that's ridiculous. You've had five husbands, you're with someone now. There's obviously something of need in your life. There's a trail of broken relationships. And you're running from God. Perhaps she's trying to quench her thirst with relationships, like so many do. But she's fallen into some kind of pattern of sin there. And... Do you know, we all do this, though. When there is something, we know it's an area of brokenness in our life, we don't want to talk about it. We want to avoid it. The relational failures. And we do exactly what she does. We deflect. Oh, I'm not married. We try and avoid the whole issue. A friend of mine is a pastor. He was once interviewing somebody for potentially becoming a Bible study leader, and he talked through a number of things about his faith and his abilities to to lead a group, And then he he touched on the the person's moral life. Will you be a person of good character? And he said, look, I know you've got a girlfriend. Is that relationship pure? And the guy said, well, I'm not breaking any of the Ten Commandments. And he paused and said, "That's, that's not what I'm asking. I'm just asking, is your relationship pure? And the guy said, the only thing I'm going to say is I'm not breaking any of the Ten Commandments. It's a deflection, isn't it? I don't want to talk about this. There's something I'm avoiding in my relationship with God. We do it, don't we? We're spiritually thirsty, but we we avoid going to the very person who can quench, who can help, who can forgive, who can heal. She avoids talking about her sin, but then she also tries to avoid coming under Jesus' authority. She says, I see you're a prophet. 
And it's hard to deny, he's just recounted her history of relationships. He's got some kind of supernatural knowledge. I see you're a prophet, but she then says, well, you know, different prophets say different things. Our fathers told us to worship here, and you guys say to worship over here, and who can know? Who can know? You worship your way, I'll worship mine. There is, in fact, a Samaritan version of the first five books of the Bible. It's called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And what's an interesting feature of this is that everywhere it talks about the place of worship, they've subbed in Mount Gerizim. You may not have heard of Mount Gerizim, but that's because it's subbed in everywhere where you'd think about Jerusalem, it's subbed in a different mountain. And so she's saying, look, there's other, people have different opinions on where we should worship. Truth is fuzzy. Worship is fuzzy. In fact, she says, verse 24, when the Messiah comes, he'll explain these things. I don't expect to know now, I'll just keep on as I am. Do you see what she's doing? This is deflecting as well. This is saying, I can't really pin down the, the, the truth here. I'm interested in what you're saying, but I, I, I'm going to continue as I am for now. And you know, our world loves to avoid Jesus that way. You worship your way, I'll worship mine. I'll worship over here at the mountain of love, you worship over there at whatever mountain you're worshipping at. And Christians do this as well, church, whole denominations do this. They, they, they get their mountain and they sub that in everywhere in the Bible. But it doesn't work with Jesus, does it? Because how does he respond? Verse 23, he says, worship actually isn't about the place. Worship is about the one you're worshipping. What has he said about how to relate to him? What's the truth? He's, he's spirit. So first of all, mountains aren't the issue. But you must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is, listen to him. What has he said about how relationship with God works? Verse 26, Jesus says, you're waiting for the Messiah to explain things. He's here, I'm right in front of you. There's nothing fuzzy here. And it's, it's foolishness, isn't it, to say that Jesus never said anything clear about how to worship God, how to live for God, how to respond rightly to God. Jesus spoke about the life lived, worshipping God. He spoke about sin. He spoke about money. He spoke about immorality. He spoke about pride. He spoke about anger. He spoke about marriage. There's nothing fuzzy there. And when people claim that there is no truth in the spiritual realm, that's avoiding Jesus, isn't it? That's avoiding Jesus, avoiding coming under His authority. So she's thirsty, desperately thirsty. And she comes to Jesus, but then avoids drinking. Maybe you see yourself in there somewhere, avoiding talking about sin, avoiding coming under Jesus' authority, but at the same time so thirsty, those dry spiritual lips. Why is my experience of church so dry? My experience of faith, why is it parched compared to those wet seasons so long ago? Is it? Is it possible? Is it possible? It's because you're avoiding the Jesus right in front of you. Is it possible to cry out to Jesus in prayer and then avoid Him in your life, in your conscience? Isn't that kind of what my kids do with water, water? They cry out about the headache and then refuse to drink the water. Jesus says to us, if you know who it is you're speaking to, then come, ask, receive, drink the living water, believe and receive, believe that I am the thirst quencher and stop drinking the bucketfuls when you can have the well, stop gulping the salt water when you can have the ice cold living water. Come to me, Jesus says, drinking is believing. We're going to sing. Please stand as we sing our final song, O Come to the Altar. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Just with the reading this morning, I was thinking, I've got a great record at home. I'm going to have to listen to when I get home. Who remembers Peter, Paul and Mary? Well, a few of you. Jesus met the woman at the well. I'm looking forward to listening to that, but listening to it in the context of the living water. If you've got a copy at home, why don't you try it yourself? Um, are you struggling to drink that living water yourself? Maybe have a conversation after church as we mingle around and perhaps have a coffee. One's okay, isn't it, John? <laughs> I don't want to do Calvin out of a job. But, um, yep, please feel free to stay and have a, a bite to eat and, and a drink and have some more fellowship. And we'll finish our time together by saying the grace to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.